All right, welcome to Jay's Analysis. I apologize, I'm not in uh, my usual setting. We are on the road. Jamie has a podcast she's got to do, so we had to take a trip. But um, happy to be here again with the Collins brothers. And it's been, I think, two years almost. It's been too long, but I did hear them on PSYOP Cinema recently. They did a, an excellent interview there. Uh, if you guys didn't hear that, go check out their really long breakdown of uh, their classic text. Now, I think it's in the classics of the of the of the analysis sphere for when it comes to uh, psyops and really everything since the enlightenment in terms of the establishment and social engineering giving us a new worldview and that book that book is called invoking the beyond um, i highly recommend it there's a, almost a little 300 page section that's its own book within the book that deals with particularly the alien social engineering narrative and since i had the collins brothers on this alien nonsense has popped off big time so i want to get these guys back on because they're the best when it comes to researching this topic especially and i want to go back a little bit to the um predecessors to i think what is it halevi jacob halevi uh different figures that really set the stage for the modern uh, alien mythos how it has an, a Gnostic element, how it has a, a, a technocratic element. And then we're going to look at some of those recent so-called alien disclosure claims, video claims, uh, Pentagon, Navy intelligence people coming out with these stories and these narratives, which are usually the same old stories that we've heard. But so take us back to the post-Enlightenment era. Remind us of what the Kantian rift is. And then how do we get into the... Uh, the predecessors to, to today's uh, Gnostic technocracy uh, before we get into the alien stuff. Yeah, sure. Uh, enlightenment with the 18th century enlightenment, we see uh, among one of its most influential theoreticians was a man by the name of Immanuel. And uh, Immanuel Kant, basically what he, uh, what he posited was that there is a disjunction between the world of appearances, the world that we perceive, and the world as it is, or the dates in the original German, the thing in itself. So uh, actual reality may be, uh, in fact, uh, disproportionate with reality as we experience it. Um, so as a result um, um, of this uh, this rift, and we call we dub it this uh, the neologism of the means perennially imperceptible. We may never know it. We may never ever uh, know the ding on seek. And uh, uh, this uh, epistemological revolution that Kant set into motion, you see the seeds for it in. Um, uh ancient gnosticism uh gnosticism uh held uh, a, a very similar epistemological position and that was that the world was a deceptive simulacrum that uh it was uh not real that it was uh a a cosmic abortion um it's a very disteleological view of things um and uh, uh, out of that uh, view, uh, arrive at this uh, Masotheism concerning uh, the God of uh, Creator Jehovah. Because after all, why would the Creator God have created such a uh, terrible, uh, deceptive mirage for all of us, unless he himself were uh, evil? And um, so the, the Gnostic epistemology kind of provided the seeds for uh, 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 a revolution. But at any rate, um, Kant's epistemological revolution uh, renders the entire external world as a deceptive, as, as a, a terra incognita, a dark continent. And now, because uh, it's been rendered a dark continent, it's been rendered... Uh, you know, infinitely imperceptible. Uh, we have the uh, uh, the rise of modern myth makers who can populate that terra incognita with any number of uh, uh, surrogates for the divine. Because after all, if if Kant's epistem epistemology holds sway, then all of the cherished 
certainties of the past, uh, you know, uh, heaven, hell, angels, demons, uh, and God, all of those are, uh, all of those are, are basically, uh, epistemic incertitude. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, now there's, and that's where we have the introduction of what we dub the beyond, beyond is basically any deific force invoked by the power elite to overwhelm national governments epistemologically and ontologically. And this invocation precipitates the uh, subsequent uh, introduction of a deus ex machina in the form of a technocratic world state. And of course, such a global managerial uh, model would be advantageous for the power elite because they lay claim to uh, some vaguely defined socio-political gnosis that qualifies them to lead humanity towards its glorious transfiguration. But typically the beyond assumes a form that's of the deific powers populating classical mythology, but, but it, 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 it doesn't, it, it's derivative of those myths, but it is a, also a distortion of those myths. Thanks to Kant's epistemological revolution and everything, the world's Aterian cognita, all those medical certainties have been ever ban banished. And um, as a result, the new myths that we see populating uh, uh, modernity and, well, and post-modernity now are myths in the pejorative sense, not Myths and transcendence. Uh, myths and the transcendence or the classical myths uh, always uh, elucidated truths beyond themselves. So they always, they always uh, touched upon. Uh, 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 they always touched upon uh, uh, per meaning and purpose that was shared among humanity, and and always uh, they they always just elucidated a truth. Um, uh, not so with uh, modern myths. Uh, modern myths um, um, follow the same uh, hermeneutical tradition of Gnosticism because they invert the binary of good and evil. Uh, they reverse the roles of God and Satan, angels and demons, heroes and villains, etc. Modern myths uh, basically hold all things in suspicion, uh, especially the uh, alter of uh, reality itself. And we see this conversionist uh, narrative tradition on display with the various invocations of the beyond. Uh, the beyond, as we cover it in our book, is invoked as uh, a wrathful earth goddess in the, uh, it, which is a story of God's planets and the relationship of the feminine to the divine. Um, the invoked uh, AI and technological singularity, uh, which we see exemplified in transhumanist movement, uh, you know, God, it's, it's reinterpreted as the mere circumvent of bias, a super weapon, and by the way, um, Oppenheimer, but um, it's basically uh, uh, that 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 invocation of the. Uh, I'm going to try you stopping know, is, my video. Uh, I'm going to try stopping my video real quick. Power and agnostically reinterpreted. Yeah. I said, I'm going, to, I'm going to try just stopping my video to see if it gets a little, it's a little choppy. So go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's the Prome the Promethean flame that uh, basically reinterpreted as an attainable deific power uh, and agnostically reinterpreted Messiah that will, uh, liberate man from uh, corrupt materiality, immobilize history in a state of utopian permanence. Uh, and then uh, lastly, and this is the last iteration of the beyond that we cover in the book, mm -hmm. perhaps the most fantastical is, of course, the beyond invoked as extraterrestrial gods, which is right. a reinterpreted taxonomy of angels, demons, and other heavenly beings, the most significant of which, of course, being God. But um, that that's from whence the the beyond arises is out of the yep. uh, Kantian riff and and uh, that is that's the purpose that it serves is to be invoked uh, so as 
to provide a rationale for the introduction of Deus Ex, ex Machina, which invariably is always a, a new world order and right. uh, a new man. So it seems to me that, um, you know, some people might be hearing this if they're new to the channel or something like this. They might think, well, uh, you know, why, why would governments or power elite or social engineers, why would they care about philosophy or worldviews? I mean, this seems like they're concerned with power. They don't really care about people, you know, sitting around speculating about metaphysics and the existence of other beings. And uh, I would just remind people that there are many examples of uh, high level power elite or power elite adjacent people. Take, for example, um, Cass Sunstein, who was uh, one of Obama's uh, czars. You know, Sunstein wrote a paper about um, conspiracy theories and what he called cognitive infiltration. And in that paper, if you've read it, he goes very deep into philosophy, believe it or not. He he spends a lot of time discussing the Enlightenment, discussing how people construct worldviews and narratives for their own lives. And that's just one example amongst many. And so I would just encourage people to, to begin yeah, it's, to it's, go it's ahead. Pre- Oh, it's present. It's present with the current UFO deception. And exactly. Current, yeah. yeah and exactly. the current crop in well, the current crop of quote unquote whistleblowers at the very end of the article. OK, David Grush is our is our latest addition to this rogue gallery of, of fake uh, whistleblowers. Right. And David Grush at the very end, he was he was introduced to the public in a debrief article that was written if, um, by uh, Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Kane. Leslie Kane is another very important person that plays a very important role in the UFO deception. But anyways, you reach the very end of that article and what does he say at the end? He says my he, he says that what he hopes to induce is quote unquote on ontological shock. <laughs> yeah. An ontological <laughs> shock. It basically ontological shock it it is the demolition of worldviews. Yes. Also, um, if you read, uh, and I'm sure you probably have, Jay, uh, Christopher Simpson's uh, uh, seminal work over uh, a psychological warfare, um, a science of coercion, I believe it's what I it's believe called. so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the science of coercion, he uh, uh, talks about William Wild Bill Donovan and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The, the OSS, which was the precursor to the CIA. But what they did was they basically cribbed liberally from uh, the Nazis and their uh, uh, their psychological uh, uh, warfare, uh, their psychological warfare yep. strategies. And the Nazis referred to th- that as Weltanschauung, which is basically german for worldview warfare right psychological psychological warfare is 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 mainly about it, it it's mainly about reshaping resculpting worldviews resculpting the prism through which the world is viewed resculpting our 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 the hermeneutic according to which reality is understood so right. that it's it, so that we the world in a manner that is more advantageous to the social engineers. Yeah, I've been I've been going back through some of these older uh, Tavistock type things. I, I just bought Lipman's Walter Lipman's book, Public Opinion, from 1920. I haven't read it yet, but of course I've read you know Bernays and some of these other books on uh, you know psych- classics on psychological warfare, like Paul Leinbarger and. You know, a lot of times they'll talk about the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of what they're up to is actually tweaking, nudging, shifting. It's not so much about, um, you know, pure raw power. It's about um, gradually, as you said, or or radically shifting people's entire perspectives. And that's that's why that 1968 or nine Brookings Institute paper says that the release of the, <clears throat> of the, the so-called discovery of uh, alien life would have tremendous ramifications to basically destroy uh, all Western biblical notions of history and, and man's meaning. And so this is very important for shaping and giving people new worldviews. And that's what I'm trying to convey to the audience. So let's, let's rewind. Oh, go ahead. Sure. No, no, go right ahead. Well, if you had any other references, uh, that Simpson book is oh, great. Well, and it made me think of Tavistock and Lipmon and, you know, any other, uh, you know, H.C. Wells does this kind of stuff. So sure. I, I know that when you get into some of the some of the deep state actors that are more related with UFO, um, 
with uh, UFO deception, you find a greater appreciation of of um, of philosophy. Um, not, that, I mean, they intend on exploiting the philo philosophies to nefarious ends, but right. you have a greater appreciation. For instance, in our book, um, one of the UFO uh, uh, disinformation agents that we go into is my is Michael Aquino. Yeah, and uh, I I I quote extensively in that chapter from Aquino's own documents over lesser black magic. And he just runs the gambit from Plato to Aristotle yes. to Hume. So, you know, these people are familiar. Well, you know, a certain cross section of that, that uh, kind of uh, covert political ecosystem, uh, the, the, a certain cross section of them are very much, you know, in tune with philosophy. So in very appre and uh, uh, appreciative of the of of the different philosophers and uh, and basically uh, exploit those um, in a very pragmatic way uh, right. those those philosophers' ideas and all. So, yeah, and, and let's not forget that some of these philosophers have actually been recruited into varying degrees of intelligence uh, uh, work. Uh, we we think of the French deconstructionists, for example, who worked with the CIA during the Cold War. Um, uh, there were the Congress for Cultural Freedom, for example, recruited people like Bert, Bertrand Russell. Uh, right. I think, if I recall, Quigley says that Isaiah Berlin was working on behalf of the Anglo-American establishment. So, so various philosophers themselves have even recruited, not necessarily for psyops work, but for the pushing of soft power uh, establishment right. narratives. So this is this needs to be understood in order to understand how it's then possible that the so-called alien story could be part of this overall deception. So let me ask you this. Let's rewind a little bit maybe to, to the 1940s. Um, tell us about why you think this is really starting to pop off in the 40s with things like Project Sign and, and these weird uh, 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 early, early phases, the Magic 12 and the, the, uh, the Roswell story, the Georgia Damsky why do you think in the 40s and 50s this really begins to pop, to, to pop off? Um, I think that what was happening was that the uh, was that the cult of the super weapon was being used to midwife um, the uh, the the uh, the whole uh, UFO deception. Mm -hmm. uh, by by the way, when uh, Paul invokes that phrase, uh, cult of the super weapon, that was coined by h bruce franklin and it's it, he uses it in reference to this faddish obsession with uh the super weapon uh the super weapon of course uh conceptually speaking began off as something rather nebulous it had it had been uh appeared in, in several works of science fiction uh in particular hg wells yep. uh it's the most uh no the the most readily available reference i can think of uh and many other works of science fiction it 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 it, it, it typically manifested itself in the forms of poison gases mm -hmm. uh, uh an unstoppable aerial armada or uh you know eventually uh, uh orbitable beam weapons mm -hmm. and reach its crescendo with uh the atom bomb which uh by the way the the Manhattan project uh, which gave, you know, which produced the atom bomb, that mm -hmm. would actually, uh, the, the uh, system of compartmentalization, how, how that uh, project was structured, was actually directly influenced uh, Leo Zillard, the Hungarian uh, scientist uh, uh, who uh, uh, presided over that, was actually influenced by H.G. Wells' uh, work, The World Set Free. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, that's where the 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 uh, term atom bomb first appears is in the world yes. set free, um, but um, it's the, this uh, this uh, faddish obsession with the super weapon in uh, multiple forms, but that segues uh, uh, into the uh, into the uh, alien deception. Yeah. Um, yeah, because what happened was that Project Sign, which you mentioned earlier. In 1949, they published a report, and which which went over the topic of of UFOs, and um, there was an appendix to that report in a letter that appeared in that appendix by a doctor James E. Lip. 
he and he was an aeronautical engineer and a department head at the Rand Corporation. Mm -hmm. And um, what he suggested in that in that letter was that you know one possibility was that um, these aliens, these otherworldly creatures, had detected nuclear explosions here on Earth. Mm -hmm. And that's what drew their attention to Earth. And that's why we were seeing uh, the visitation uh, yeah. by these, by these otherworldly creatures. And now he ended up saying, you know, that the likelihood of that, that hypothesis being, you know, that, that, that uh, being, being the answer was, was very low, but what happened was that, was that a uh, covert political um, circles, uh, you know, centered around groups like the Rand Corporation, which he was a part of, centered around the uh, United States Air Force, which yeah. had uh, which had started uh, Project Sign. Right. Uh, they latched onto that, and they started to create this narrative. Um, you know that that uh, that basically uh, Earth was being visited by a variety of different extraterrestrials uh, who had somehow detected, they had seen through um, very powerful telescopes or, yeah. or some other form of detection, some other technology and all, that we had mastered nuclear power and they were thus concerned about our mastery of, 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 nu of nuclear power. And this was causing the, uh, the visiting and they weaved it into their overall deception and all. So, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the whole uh, nuclear fetishist um, ended up uh, actually creating this, uh, this next, um, invocation of the beyond, right. uh, you know, is um, yeah. extraterrestrial and, gods. And if I if I may also add, um, uh, synchronizing with, uh, in particular, the uh, the great wave of UFO sightings that occurred in the summer and fall of 1947, mm -hmm. the latter the latter half of the 40s, synchronizing with that was the discovery of the Ma Nag Hammadi. Uh, codices which of mm -hmm. course mm -hmm. you know are are gnostic, uh, right gnostic yeah. right and uh none other than uh carl Kuhn played a major role in the popularization of the gnostic codices well, and he also but, wrote about uh, ufos too that's right he, yeah and, and, as a matter of fact he says in uh his work over ufos uh he he characterized the phenomena as a quote-unquote and these are his words living myth Mm -hmm. So we see the emergence yes. of a new myth, right. him acting as a modern myth maker. But he says uh, in his work, let me see here. He says, and I quote, uh, yeah, there is an old saying that God is a circle whose center is everywhere and the circumference nowhere. God in his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence is a totality symbol par excellence, something round, complete, and perfect. Yeah. The epiphanies of this sort are in the tradition often associated with fire and light on the antique level. Therefore, the UFOs could easily be conceived as gods, unquote. Yes. So we see there now the invocation of the beyond as extraterrestrial gods. These these things are not simply just off-worldly, you know, ha have, uh, you know, uh, off-world uh, off uh, visitors. They are also the new gods. They have they now have supplanted the cherished metaphysical certainty of God. But uh, Carl Hume was also uh, connected with intelligence circles and connected right, correct. with yeah. yes. uh, the deep state was a, the deep state was able to tap into his, um, his ideas oh, yeah. um, because he had a relationship with Alan Dulles, but I believe that Alan Dulles and him between the two of them, they shared a mistress and Mary Bancroft and I believe that uh, he also acted as the therapist to uh, to Clover uh, Dulles, Dulles' well, he, his wife. I would add, too, on top of that, um, even above the Dulles's, uh, he was doing psychoanalysis for various members of the Rockefeller family. Right. Uh, right. And was even telling them that they were reincarnated uh, pharaonic brides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally, no. it's it's in the Call Your Horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on them. 
Yeah. But you notice that now with, with uh, several contactee, uh, alien contactee philosophies, they yeah. propose that God is God, you know, uh, the God of theology is by definition an extraterrestrial. Right. But this proposition, it's plagued by terminological inexactitude because the term extraterrestrial, it's derived from the Latin word extrus, meaning outside, and terrestris, meaning earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and indeed, God is outside of earth in his transcendence. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the space religionist, that, that mean, being situated outside earth merely means inhabiting space. And by locating yeah. God exclusively in the physical universe, UFO religions elevate his amanence to the detriment of his transcendence. So the God of uh, space religion indwells the material cosmos, but never ontologically transcends it. Right. So God becomes this intramundane divinity. But this conception of God, this uh, and this overall hermeneutic, uh, began with uh, uh, a uh, uh, Enlightenment uh, theoretician, an Enlightenment pamphleteer and printer by the name of, uh, and you mentioned him earlier, Jacob Alevi. Mm -hmm. um, and he 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 promulgated this odd neo gnostic narrative between 1730 and 1750, and that narrative can be found in his works such as the layman's. Uh, Vindication of the Christian Religion, the Oration mm -hmm. at Joiner's Hall, uh, and in in these works, Elevi transposes the eschaton of heaven and hell into the vacuum, celest uh, separating celestial bodies into space, the expanse, yeah. and Elevi basically echoes the uh, cosmological pessimism of his uh, ancient Gnostic antecedents by claiming that Earth is. A, a hell that is to say yeah. the place inferior to heaven and he expresses this distinctly this teleological uh contention that earth is bereft of any purpose um and he says that quote no uh no new order of beings was created by uh was created to people it in other words earth serves no purpose it doesn't have a purpose and we were never meant to be here and by the way you see themes like this this is nothing new you see themes like this conveyed for instance in christopher nolan's uh film interstellar michael kane's character to paraphrase him loosely basically tells matthew mcconaughey um well maybe this was never meant to be our home <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly you, you even see it in things like um um uh, escape, um, well, the the Witch Mountain series from Disney, yes. where these these aliens are embodied as humans, right? And they're just, and all of Earth becomes becomes this kind of this um, this strange land that you know that that they can't navigate, right? Right. And well, but childhood's th this end demonic... too, right? And childhood's end. Yes. Right. Earth is yes. a, a place to. Um basically farm humans to the next stage of evolutionary process and then it needs to be destroyed right yeah. absolutely yeah well and there again is the intelligence connection called the right. arthur's right. Uh, intelligence uh, pedigree there yeah. but uh, you know a as you know jay that 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 demonic portrayal of the world okay it's obviously derivative of ancient gnostic uh cosmology sure. uh which yeah which Elevi was probably uh very cognizant of most uh, a great many of the uh uh enlightenment theoreticians were uh very conscious of uh gnostic uh teaching um but um um Elevi upheld that docetistic appraisal of the world mm -hmm. and this cosmological pessimism uh logically segued into an anthropological pessimism yes Elevi basically he divested man of his unique position as imago dei or the a, a divine image bearer of god for whom the earth was created as a lovely cosmic bequest and instead elevi declared that man was an apostate angel that was mm. imprisoned within the corporeal prison of the physical body and yeah. in order to escape that prison and transcend the penal colony of the world man had to undergo some vaguely defined earthbound test and upon completion of this purgatorial trial man would spiritually ascend to other planets which Elevi uh, claimed to be empyrene habitations and in support of this claim Elevi uh, cited uh, uh, the book of John chapter 14 verse 2 
uh, wherein Jesus, of course, states, in my father's house are many mansions. Now, those many mansions for a Levi uh, that comprised the father's house were actually the alien, in his alien worlds. <laughs> world, yep, alien worlds, off-world habitations. And, and this was a contention. This was the same contention held by uh, a, a by William Durham, who was a member of the Royal uh, Society, which arguably mm -hmm. was a a Masonic organization.